Okay. Hi, friends. Um, so welcome to our first uh, lecture for Abrupt Climate Change. As I mentioned on the first day of class, this course is really going to focus on um, contemporary climate change, climate change that's kind of been occurring since the mid-1800s, the mid-19th century. And the reason we call it abrupt is because in terms of sort of the geologic history of Earth, um, this climate change moment that we're in um, has, been, has been happening very quickly. The time scale of the climate changes that we have seen is very short in terms of sort of if, if, we, if we look out at sort of Earth's entire um, history as a planet and, and also the history of, of life on Earth. And, and so we're really going to focus on the, on, the, on the last, you know, 150 or so years of climate change that we've been observing. And to contextualize that, I want to start with a discussion of extinction. And the reason why I want to start with this discussion is because many scientists and, and, and other scholars and academics in related fields uh, do think that we are in the midst of, excuse me, what's known as a sixth mass extinction um, event, and we'll get to that. And so I, I, want, I like starting with this because I think it really situates us in the urgency of the climate crisis and this moment that we're in and, um, and, and sort of contextualizes the abruptness, really, of the climate change that's occurring. Um, so let's get to it. We're going to start. Um, before we can, we can talk about extinction, we've got to talk about what life is. And so life, I think we all kind of, you know, we can look around and we can say that we know uh, this thing is alive and, and this thing is not, right? So these plants are alive. This dresser um, or bureau is not alive. Um, but why is that? Why do we know that? How do we, how do we distinguish between um, the two things? And there are really four characteristics that define living organisms, that define life. The first is metabolism. Everything must essentially eat, okay? So we can think of metabolism as, as eating and digesting. So it's kind of the sum of all the chemical reactions by which energy is provided and used for life processes. Um, so, you know, in humans, it's, it's kind of digestion, and in plants, it's photosynthesis, and in bacteria, microbes in the soil, perhaps it's respiration. Either way, all living organisms must consume something and metabolize it in order to kind of sustain life. And so in that vein, then, life must also grow. There must also be growth. Um, so you eat something, you, you metabolize it, you digest it, and then you grow, okay? And growing can be um, in, in physical sides or it can just size, uh, for example, from, a, from an infant human to a, to a full-grown adult um, human, there's a growth there. There's a size growth. There's a physical size uh, change. Uh, growth can also mean just the ordering and organizing of atoms and molecules to make uh, larger molecules or more, or more organized molecules. But in, in any event, to do this, requires a source of energy, and that energy comes from the things that we metabolize, okay? The third characteristic is that um, all life must reproduce. Um, there must be the creation of new organisms, new life, through cell division or through asexual or sexual means. Somehow, all life must reproduce. All life must be able to produce new life. Otherwise, what's, you know, kind of what's the point <laughs> of life? Um, and then finally, the fourth characteristic is evolution. All life must evolve. Um, and evolution, I think, you know, we learn in, 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 um, in high school, um, is the process by which genetic changes occur in populations of organisms. Um, we classify life in many different ways. Uh, one of the ways that we, we classify it is we kind of uh, describe and categorize it at various levels of um, of complexities. So you have cells, which are kind of the, the basic sort of building blocks um, of life, and in those cells often you have DNA or RNA or some sort of genetic coding that tells the cell what it's supposed to be doing, that tells the organism what it's supposed to be doing. And then, of course, as we scale up, um, multiple cells put together can create an organism. Now, also, there are some organisms that are singular cells, um, like bacteria and amoeba and other things, um, but there also are many organisms that are multiple cells, multicellular, as we say. Um, and so organisms is just kind of like one life form. I'm an organism. Um, this lemon tree, which looks very sad in the winter, is an organism. 
Um, this elephant ear alocasia plant is an organism. My dog, who I believe is behind me here, is also an organism. Um, when you have a bunch of organisms together, you have a population. And um, so we have the population of, of Chicago, we have the population of Illinois, we have the population of, um, of the United States, of humans, right? Um, within Chicago, we also have a population of, uh, you know, squirrels. Uh, we have a population of rats. We have a population of, of maple trees. Um, and then if you take all of the populations um, of the same type of organism, and we'll talk about how that gets defined, then you have species, okay? So um, in terms of, you know, us, we are the human uh, species, our species is Homo sapiens, um, but there are millions and millions and millions of species on the planet um, which uh, are, are made up of populations of organisms. And then if we scale up from there, we've got communities and then ecosystems, which is a bunch of different species interacting with their physical um, environment. And then one step up from ecosystems is you have biomes, which is sort of a group grouping of similar ecosystem types. So we have, you know, for example, deserts. Uh, tropical rainforests, um, boreal um, forests in the Arctic. Okay, these are these are these are examples of biomes. We can also classify life in 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 terms of kingdoms, in terms of the types of species that exist. So we of course have animals, we have plants, uh, we have fungi, which is like mushrooms and and um, mold and those sorts of things. We also have protists, the most famous. Um, protist is an amoeba, for example, typically singular celled, um, not quite bacteria, not quite fungi. And then we have bacteria and we have archaea bacteria, which is kind of, um, you can think of as a sort of more primitive um, or more simplified or simplistic uh, type of bacteria. Um, so we have kind of six, six major kingdoms. Um, and uh, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. I just want to make sure there's nothing else. Yes, we've got like six six major kingdoms, and we'll talk about how kind of these are all classified and, and how that's um, changing and evolving and, and our knowledge of that and our, our insight into the, the various um, classifications of life is always changing. Um, so, but for, before we get there, and, and, and the, the ultimate goal of this um, lecture is to talk about extinction, we've got to start with the history of life on Earth. Um, and then how that leads us to our understanding of, of mass extinction. So let's begin at the very beginning, at the, at the what I call the Earth birth, um, the birth of the planet, about 4.55 billion years ago, which is um, often uh, the shorthand for billion years is G-Y-R-S. No, no idea why they use the G, I guess, um, to distinguish it from something else that's um, using a B. That would be too similar. Anyway, um, so at the beginning of um, the planet's life, um, this kind of molten, newly formed rock is hurling through space around the sun. Um, it's very hostile. Here's an artistic rendering of what it might have looked like. You've got volcanoes and you've got um, lots of magma and lava on the surface of the planet. You don't really have an atmosphere, and what atmosphere you do have is certainly not conducive to, to life, um, per se. Um, it's just a very violent... Um, uninhabitable, probably not very cute place, honestly. Um, and that lasts for about, you know, half a billion years uh, to almost a billion years. And then, um, and then we kind of move into a new eon, which is, um, which uh, scientists and geologists have labeled the Archaean Eon, which began about 3.85 billion years ago. And that, that date is actually very important for this conversation specifically if we're talking about life okay so um after you know 500 700 million years of um of volcanic eruptions and and this very hostile uh earth environment the the very little water that is emitted each time kind of a volcano erupts or each time like a seam opens up in the crust of the earth that little bit of water is allowed to make it to the surface where it can accumulate in the atmosphere or it can it can accumulate on the surface of the earth. And, and after millions of years of that, you start to get oceans. You start to get clouds that are raining and they, they keep raining and raining and raining and raining. And then you have an ocean. And then eventually in those oceans, you have the first life forms about 3.85 billion years ago, or about 4 billion years ago, if you want to just kind of keep a, a shorthand um, 
uh, in your brain of like when life on Earth started. Okay, so about four billion years ago, about half a billion years after Earth birth. <laughs> the earliest organism at this time was probably even simpler than, than a bacteria. Um, it had some genetic information floating around, no, no nucleus, um, not a lot of information um, contained in the cell itself. Um, nevertheless, you do have the first uh, life on Earth. And the three uh, sort of necessary components that had to come together to create that life 3.85 or whatever billion years ago um, are, are these, these uh, three things that are listed here. So to start, you've got chemosynthesis, which is basically in the ocean, okay, where the first life um, we think was, uh, was. Um, you've got this chemical synthesis of small organic molecules, carbon, nitrogen, um, these types of things, oxygen, um, ordering themselves into what we call amino acids, kind of the building blocks of proteins. And then um, we move from chemosynthesis to biosynthesis. Biosynthesis is like sort of the collection of, of all of these amino acids to form, to form a protein chain, a protein um, complex molecule known as a protein, okay? And then, so you've got chemosynthesis, and then you've got biosynthesis, and then um, finally, you can order those protein strands that are comprised of those amino acids into what we call RNA and DNA, which contain the genetic information um, for a cell. Hang on. So there are kind of two theories that we're, we're often taught um, in, in grade school um, and middle school and high school on, on, on how like, these things happen, how chemosynthesis and biosynthesis and the, and, the, and the ordering of DNA happened. And one of the popular theories is that there was kind of this primordial soup, that the oceans were just all of these chemicals and uh, chemical processes and, 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 and um, organic molecules just floating around in the surface water and they kind of clump together and then over time they form larger and larger molecules due to the heat from the sun, the heat from volcanoes, the reactions on the surfaces of some of these rocks, and then eventually you get an amino acid and then you get a protein strand and a DNA. Um, that theory, I think, is kind of being sort of replaced by or has been replaced by this black smokers theory, which is these deep sea hydrothermal vents deep in the ocean um, where you've got warm um, uh, material, um, you know, lava, magma, um, smoke, um, particulates, um, fragments of rocks, etc., kind of coming out from, from, from the mantle, from, from beneath the crust. Um, they're very warm. There's a lot of chemical reactions that are happening on the surfaces of these hydrothermal vents. And so um, you've got organic molecules which are, which are, which are forming and, and grouping together on the surfaces of minerals on these black smokers. They become more and more concentrated, more complex reactions begin to occur. You've got energy from this hot sulfur-rich water. And then uh, sort of voila, you've got a chemosynthesis and then a biosynthesis and then you've got a DNA and, or an RNA actually. You probably had an RNA first before you had a DNA. Um, so then, boom, you've got um, a very simple organism about four billion years ago, similar to an archaea bacteria, just a, just a, a very, very simple organism with some genetic um, information contained in the cytoplasm itself. Then you've got four billion years on Earth for life to evolve to where we are today. Um, and a lot's happened in that time, and uh, we're going to talk about that. So for much of Earth's history, actually, life was very simple. Um, it was singular cells, um, not very ordered, and in the ocean. So if we look at the history of um, the planet in terms of kind of, let's say, a, a 24-hour clock, okay, um, or in this case, I think this drawing is divided into sort of five quadrants, so each quadrant representing 20% um, of Earth's history, right, or actually of the history of the solar system. So you've got uh, the solar system forms here and then about, you know, um, 4.5 or so billion years ago, uh, you've got um, the origin of Earth, okay, and then um, you've got a very long time where there's no life on Earth, okay, several um, hundreds of millions of years. Then you've got this very simple life that starts to form uh, in the ocean. If we think about this 
as a 24 hour clock, which I think is like, you know, a very cool way of thinking about it. If this is midnight. This is about 6 a.m. So by 6 a.m. you've got, you know, a very simple life forms in the ocean in the form of what we call prokaryotes, which means there's no nucleus containing the DNA or the RNA. The RNA is just kind of floating around um, inside of the cell. And that lasts until about noon on this, this hypothetical day. If all of Earth's, you know, the history of the solar system is condensed into one day, it takes until about noon to get even oxygen generating photosynthesis. It takes until maybe, you know, uh, 2 or 3 p.m. to get a eukaryotic cell, which is a cell that has a nucleus, which means that the genetic information would be contained within like a, a nucleus inside of the cell. It takes all the way to here, right, to 2 billion years ago or so um, for that to happen. And it takes almost until 6 p.m. on that day to get a multicellular organism to get an organism that's bigger than just one single cell. Um, and then things kind of, you know, it takes even longer and longer and longer. And then it's maybe what, um, you know, 10, 10 p.m. This is, if this is 6 p.m., you know, this is maybe 9 p.m., maybe 10, 10 p.m. or so, you finally get, um, you get things that live on the land. Uh, and they, they start as plants, and then you've got, you get um, animals moving to the land in the form of kind of, um, insects and and um, and amphibians and then and then reptiles and, and then eventually mammals and then finally kind of in the last you know minute uh, or, or whatever of, of earth's history you've got humans um, not even the last minute really like the last couple of um, couple of minutes to I think I believe I, I have to kind of do the math but it's um, you know the last minute or the last couple the tens of seconds or so um, you have humans. So humans are relatively new in terms of life on Earth, right? So most of Earth's history, um, you've got single-celled uh, organisms as the only life form, and then you've got multi-celled organisms, and it's only really in the last half a billion years or so that you even have anything on the land. Most of it was in the ocean. And that 500 or so million years ago date is very, very, very important when we're, when we're thinking about life on Earth. Around 570, to be precise, million years ago, um, an event which has come to be known as the Cambrian Explosion kind of occurred. Um, it didn't occur like all at once, but it was, you know, a fairly rapid increase in organism diversity. So in the number of, of, of unique species, the number of unique um, diverse types of organisms on the earth just kind of exploded around 570 million years ago. Um, this was also when there, there was um, the introduction of internal and external um, skeletons, right, for animals and insects and other, um, other organisms. And, um, and then, of course, we know like that, that very shortly after, um, plants started to move on land in the form of kind of mosses and lichens and then um, grasses and then trees and etc. Um, so why did this explosion occur? No one really knows. Um, perhaps sexual reproduction um, was was found to be the most advantageous uh, way of reproducing, and, and, and as animals and plants started to capitalize on that, um, life exploded. Could also be due to a continued uh, buildup of oxygen in the in the atmosphere and the oceans, which allowed for the formation of carbonate skeletons. These skeletons helped protect life from predators, uh, from ultimate predators and, and, and environmental conditions. It gave them kind of an evolutionary leg up, and this catalyzed um, uh, this explosion, this Cambrian explosion of life. Um, again, the, the reason is, is TBD, um, but nevertheless, this occurred around 570 million years ago. Um, so this is a very cool map, I think. This really shows kind of how much life, how many species, um, individual unique species have existed on the planet. So we have Earth birth, right, around four and a half billion years ago, then around 3.85 billion years ago, you've got the first life forms, um, and you don't have a very diverse, um, you know, life is not very diverse on the planet. Um, and, and for many years, for many, many millions of years, um, and then finally, you know, around, where is it, 550 um, or so uh, million years ago, you have the Cambrian explosion. So 
here you have, you know, this is the width of this um, little slice determines how many kind of species there are, right? So at first you just have bacteria, very simple bacteria, and then you have um, archaea, which are, are actually descendants of the very simple bacteria as, 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 as other bacteria became more and more complex. Um, but nevertheless, the width here is very short, very small, right? So by, by 700 million years ago, you really only have this many species here, right? From here to here. But then something happens, this explosion, where you go from this many species to this many species. Until now, where you've got basically the whole width of this in terms of species. You've got, um, you know, all of these different types of um, species on the planet now. Protostomes. Um, echinoderm, echinoderms, sharks, fish, um, amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals, and then humans are in here somewhere, right? But you'll also notice that prior to the Cambrian explosion, you don't see this, these two words written. Um, but then after the Cambrian explosion, you see these two words written five times. You see mass extinction here, 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 and here, and possibly at the end where we are today. Before we get to the discussion of what a mass extinction is and why it's important and why I'm talking about it, we've got to also understand um, the history of the human understanding of extinction. So during the um, period of colonization, when the, when the global north and specifically kind of Europe um, was you know, brutally colonizing the whole world, um, during these, these travels, during these trips, during these colonization um, expeditions, <clears throat> European colonizers would stumble upon or, or, or discover um, things that they had never seen. Um, fossils, bones, remains. They brought them back to Europe where they were, were presented to a very curious population um, as like sort of these unknown things that people had never seen, like a peacock, right? Or, um, or elephants or, or, or various things that perhaps most Europeans um, didn't encounter in their kind of everyday everyday lives, and they were put in these cabinets of curiosities, wunderkammers, kunstkammers, um, these, these, these cabinets of curiosities or these museums um, ultimately kind of have become known as what we would call a natural history museum. The Field Museum, for example, is kind of a descendant of a cabinet of curiosity. During this time, they were, they were generally located in palaces or other um, you know, high-ranking officials' um, buildings and, and, and government government uh, property. Um, I think now natural history museums, you know, are trying to sort of separate themselves from this history, which is, is kind of dark and, and, and quite, um, you know, brutal. Uh, here's an example of the, the uh, museum War Mianum uh, from 1655. Here's another one from, from Naples, another cabinet of curiosity. You can see, you know, got crocodiles and and shells that 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 um, you know that Europeans in, in the global north had never encountered before. Um, here's just like a little sort of excerpt blurb from a from a um, collection published in 1638 discussing these like curiosities as the as these European colonizers called them a white partridge a goose which has grown in Scotland on a tree a flying squirrel another squirrel like a fish all kinds of bright colored birds from India. A number of things changed into stone, speaking about fossils, of course. Amongst others, a piece of human flesh on a bone, gourds, olives, blah, 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 okay? Remember, also, during this time, um, science, right, um, was, was kind of breaking free of the church, uh, from, from the Catholic church, from the Christian uh, traditions, and so evolution was not a thing, was not accepted, um, but what was accepted... Um, with the way that the church did think and order life on earth was in this great chain of being, which was first popularized by actually Aristotle, where you have at the top, the most sort of uh, supreme being being God, and then below God, you have angels and demons, and then, and then you have man, humans, animals, plants, and then min rocks and minerals. And so everything was kind of ordered in this linear great chain um, of being. And the idea was that the world was designed by the creator more or less like clockwork. This was the, the general thinking at the time. Um, and I don't know why I'm like being covered by this one. Uh, so, uh, hang on. Uh, so 
so the idea was like the world was kind of designed by the creator and it was filled with its various creation, but each creation had a definite place within the plan. Um, and one of the people who, who, one of the scientists who was, who was, you know, active at this time, Carl Linnaeus, Carlos Linnaeus, um, named at this time over 4,000 species of animals and over 7,000 species of plants. Um, but despite this, this, this kind of, um, you know, revolutionary understanding of plants and species and the diversity of species, Linnaeus still ascribed to the idea of the great chain of nature. He argued in his very seminal book, Sexes of Plants, published in 1760, that we must pursue the great chain of nature till we arrive at its origin. We should begin to contemplate her operations in the human frame and from thence continue our researches through the various tribes of quadrupeds, birds, reptiles, fishes, insects, and worms till we arrive at the vegetable creation. So you can see there's a lot to unpack here. There's a lot of stuff that people didn't understand, but they're starting to think about these things in the global north, right? In, in Europe, um, they're starting to think about these things. One thing that Linnaeus did think about was how similar plants are to uh, plant uh, genitalia, so to speak, are to human genitalia and animal genitalia. So he's got this diagram here where he's describing, you know, the calyx as the bedchamber, the corolla as the curtains, the filaments, the spermatic vessels, right? The anther, the testes, the pollen, the sperm, the stigma, the vulva, the style, the vagina, the germane, the ovary, the pericarp, the fecundating ovary, and the seed, the ovum, okay? And um, so because of this, right, because of this comparison that Linnaeus made between kind of the sexes of plants and the sexes of, of humans and animals, um, he decided that you could order things by how their sex organs looked. And here's an example from his book, right? So he used this, this the sexual system of, of classification um, where you've got plants, you know, with big penises, for example, and maybe big uh, seeds and, and big uh, vaginas and big flowers and small flowers and um, and this sort of thing. So he, he ordered species in this way and it was like um, kind of very... Um, you know, the, the first time a scientist in, in, in Europe, in the global north, had started thinking about things like this. So it was very scandalous at the time. Um, very, very scandalous um, to compare plants, sex, to, that, that plants have sex organs. It was, it was, it was you know, very shocking, of course, to the church, um, which never had sex. Um, but Linnaeus, still ascribing to the great chain of being, ordered everything in a very hierarchical way and found that it just didn't really work. Um, it didn't really work out. So he's ordering things, you know, for example, humans and mice have a gland and, and birds and humans and mice all have a digited limb and, and, and fish all have a back, fish and birds and, and humans and mice all have a backbone. And this is kind of the first thinking of this 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 way of, of thinking, the first person to kind of introduce this way of thinking about species. But he ran into a problem, and the problem was that making all of this into a perfect great chain was very difficult. Um, it was very hard. And so, um, you know, along comes um, a contemporary, actually like a, a post-Linnaeus uh, scientist, biologist, um, by the name of that whole thing, which I'm just going to say the last name, Cuvier. Um, and Cuvier said, okay, what you did, Linnaeus, is like very whatever. Um, sure. But we've, we've learned some things since then, and, and you were wrong. And actually, instead of looking at how, how plants and animals and species look on the outside, what we should actually do is look on the inside. We need to look very carefully at the internal anatomy and also the geologic record, Okay. So looking at these fossils um, and stop neglecting these internal parts that maybe everybody can't see, um, but actually really do define species. So for example, here is a human ear. Uh, Cuvier said, let's look inside. And what does the inside of the human ear look like? And is this similar to other species, other, other organisms, other beings? Unfortunately, despite this really sort of progressive at the time thinking, Cuvier still insisted that perhaps the great chain wasn't true, but organisms could not evolve um, because of the perfect correlation of parts. So you can see still the influence of the church here, still the religious um, influence. 
arguing that 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 organisms are well put together machines designed by kind of the creator, right? But despite this, you can still discern function and structure. And so while the great chain makes no sense, while we look at these internal structures, we can tell that there are these embranchments, that there are other ways to, to classify species by their internal organs. And this is how we've arrived at the, the current understanding of our species classification, where you have mammals who all have a mammary gland, and you have um, animals which have you know various things in common and common ancestors that are different than than plants and and bacteria and etc cetera, etc. Cetera, right. So Linnaeus was onto something, but Cuvier really refined it. What Cuvier also did, though, that was hugely important um, for for this discussion, is he also um, started talking about this idea of catastrophes, basically extinction. So arguing that, um, so he's looking, right, he's looking through the, the fossil records, he's looking at these species that are that are similar but different, um, and he, he comes to this conclusion that, that there are some species that no longer exist on the earth. Um, and he argues that life, therefore, has often been disturbed on this earth by terrible events, calamities, which at their commencement have perhaps moved and overturned to a great depth the outer, entire outer crust of the globe. Um, numberless living beings have been the victims of these catastrophes, basically outlining extinction. Some have been destroyed by sudden inundations. Others have been laid dry in consequence of the bottom of the seas being instantaneously elevated etc, etc, okay, and this is published in the early 1800s, this idea of catastrophes. Um, and as you will, as you hopefully have found in the reading that I, that I had you do for, for, um, for this week, um, you know, one of the major um, species discoveries that led Cuvier to kind of determine uh, or to, 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 to openly hypothesize about extinction and catastrophes was the American mastodon, right, the American um, North American sort of version of the woolly mammoth, um, and 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 you know Cuvier said this species does not exist anymore on the earth. It is extinct. It is gone. It's it's been succumbed. It's been it has succumbed to a catastrophe. The thread of operations is broken. Nature has changed course, and none of the agents she employs today would have been sufficient to produce her former work. So. Still not quite getting there with evolution, but saying nature gave up, you know, God or whomever gave up on this species. It, it, it succumbed to a, to a flood or a, a, a terrible disaster. Nature gave up on it, and now there are new species instead. Not quite there. It took until Darwin for the global north to really understand extinction and its context within evolution. Um, but Cuvier was, was kind of there. So he was, he was very, very important in, in determining and and. and you know, discovering or writing about the fact that creatures do go extinct, but that they don't evolve. Of course, we now know that they do, in fact, evolve. One second. Come in. My dog uh, is needy. So one obvious problem here um, is is that if Cuvier is saying that creatures go extinct and creation is perfect and all of these species are perfect, then why did they go extinct? Um, and so fossils really presented a real problem for the church, for Cuvier, for scientists who were operating in the in the, in the late 1700s and early 1800s of like what the heck is going on here, right? Noah's flood can only account for so much, and and this. Um, is part of a larger lecture that I give, which then I kind of move into um, into uh, evolution and Darwin and how we've gotten to arrive at the the, the point of knowledge about evolution that we are um, today. We're not going to talk about that in this lecture. Instead, we're going to stay on this extinctions theme. So Cuvier, very important for extinctions, unfortunately, didn't quite make it all the way there um, with the understanding of evolution as we as we know it today. Nevertheless, um, now that we understand extinctions, um, and Darwin later said that extinctions can be both these catastrophes, but also, also this, this slower um, background extinction rate where species are kind of always constantly going extinct, 
Um, but there are some major events which constitute what we now call a mass extinction, when, when a huge amount of species go extinct all at once. Um, and there have been, as I mentioned, five of them. Um, the end Orvician, the late Devonian, um, the end Permian, the end Triassic, and the end Cretaceous. The end Cretaceous, of course, here, which is kind of being hidden by me, um, this is the, aid, the, the extinction of the dinosaurs. So all of these extinctions were, 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 were humongous uh, global disasters uh, for life on Earth in their own right, some worse than others. Um, for example, you have the end Permian extinction where about 95% of all the organisms and species on Earth went extinct. Um, this happened about 250 million years ago and was likely caused by a combination of increased volcanic activity, increased atmospheric methane and carbon dioxide, and rapid global warming. Um, the results of this extinction were that oxygen was removed from the oceans and the land was desertified, and so you had an, a massive extinction of species, a massive loss of um, species diversity on the Earth. And then let's fast forward to the KT, or the end Cretaceous extinction, which is when the dinosaurs went extinct about 65 million years ago. This is the last documented uh, mass extinction likely caused by an asteroid impact, increasing volcanic activity, and rapidly falling sea levels, kind of a what we might consider a nuclear winter, a rapid cooling down of the planet. You've got these dinosaurs who are living in semi-tropical environments in the, in, the, um, in the northern hemisphere, let's say, and even all the way as far north as Canada and Alaska. Now all of a sudden it's very cold, there's snow, and they're not going to make it. They're going to go extinct. This is what happened with the KT extinction. So I've already kind of kind of hinted at this, but what are the sort of four um, main reasons, main things, uh, main factors that can cause a mass extinction event? Um, so uh, you know maybe if you want to pause and 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 take some guesses. Um, right now, normally if we were in class, I would probably ask you to raise your hands, but I'm just going to move on to the next slide here. Here are the four main causes of mass extinctions. Um, the first one, I think, probably the most, most uh, well-known, very, very popular, very infamous, probably precipitated the extinction of the dinosaurs, the KT extinction. That's an impact event, an asteroid or a very large uh, meteor hitting the Earth, um, sending a bunch of uh, dust and particulates into the atmosphere, creating what we would call a nuclear winter. Similar effects can happen from massive volcanism events. Um, so like maybe a huge flood uh, basalt eruption or, or, or like a total rupturing of the, of the crust of the earth which sends all of this ash into the atmosphere and then does a similar thing as, as an impact event in terms of the climate. Um, part and parcel of these two, you have significant global warming or significant global cooling for a number of reasons, one of which could be an impact event, also could be accumulation of various trace gases in the atmosphere, etc., etc., and then uh, finally, you have a um, rapid uh, decline in sea level, which can happen for a number of reasons, maybe the moving of the continents very quickly, or, um, uh, or a global warming, a global change, or um, uh, lots of various kind of reasons for that. So these are the four main causes of, of mass extinctions. And so, as I mentioned, we've had five of them, and it's, it's, it's likely, as you saw in the reading, and as may, perhaps you've Googled, this or you've heard this in the news that we are in the midst of a sixth mass extinction today, um, which is probably due to hunting and over harvesting. Um, you know, we 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 we've hunt, hunted the oceans of most of their fish in the last 100 years, for example. Um, also, a combination of de deforestation and desertification, so habitat loss for a lot of these species, a lot of um, especially large megafauna, like large animals and and plants. Um, you have uh, increased, of course, pollution from human activities, um, exotic or introduced, or what we might call invasive species spreading. Um, you know, around like there's a there's a there's a really big uh, sort of problem, I guess we could say, with Asian carp in the in the Mississippi and and um, its tributaries, and and they're they're potentially going to get into the Great Lakes. It's a it's a, a cause for concern and also probably a reason why we're, we're potentially in the midst of a mass extinction. These, these invasive species are kind of taking advantage of uh, an opportune environment. And then perhaps climate change as well. And that's kind of why, that's the lead into this class, right? That's the, 
we've contextualized it. We've we've kind of addressed the urgency of this, and we're 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 on we're all on the same page here. Um, just to kind of put it in terms of a number, background extinction rate before all this human activity. So on average, maybe 15 species per year go extinct. That's kind of a background rate. Today, in some tropical forests, the extinction rate has been measured at about 27 thousand species per year. So we are definitely probably in the midst of a major extinction event. Whether or not it will be big enough to be classified as a six mass extinction, I don't think we'll ever be able to know that because these things take, you know, tens to hundreds of thousands of years uh, to do. But it is very likely that we are witnessing um, a sixth mass extinction on the planet. So go us, I guess. Um, I did want to touch on kind of the, the aesthetic uh, part of this. I think, you know, we are at an art school and I, I really like to kind of bring these kinds of discussions into the material. Um, so here's a here's an infographic I found online um, titled Biological Annihilation of Species Worldwide Says Study. Um, and one thing I want to point out here is that the four species that we're, we're talking about here as, as sort of going extinct, orangutans, lions, giraffes, cheetahs. I'm very sad about them, um, that it's awful. But these are all what we would call charismatic or enigmatic species, and I think they sometimes distort our understanding of extinctions. Um, these are species that are charismatic, we relate to them, they, we've, we can anthropomorphize them, right? We can ascribe emotions and feelings, they have families, they have kids, we see them, they're kind of like us, right? They're charismatic, they're enigmatic, we, we relate to them. Um, but they're not the only ones that are being affected by this mass extinction event. And in many cases, um, the sort of more biologically important species that are going extinct are invisible or not nearly as interesting or charismatic or relatable. So they're often not talked about, um, but their extinction and their loss is equally important, if not more important in some, in some cases. And, and we'll talk about that um, you know, together probably tomorrow. Um, so I, I mentioned that climate change is probably precipitating a sixth mass extinction. I think some of the species that we've talked about, these charismatic megafauna that are really vulnerable to extinction are long-lived low reproduction rates, large, um, require large territories and lots of food. They're highly specialized like the panda or the rhino or the elephant or the giraffe, these sorts of things, right? But there are a vast number of species kind of that are not charismatic megafauna, that are not these large um, enigmatic species that are going extinct, that are that, that have um, much more significance in terms of the sort of global ecosystem of life. So as we move uh, forward in, in both this course and just in your own thinking about extinction, some things we have to think about are, are what is the future of life on Earth and how is that changing in terms of the environment, um, whether it's caused by humans or a response to humans. Oh no, I think I froze. Um, let me see if I can come back, come back from the dead. Maybe, yes, all right, I'm back. Um, so yeah, here we go. Yeah, so as I was saying, we've got to think about kind of the the environment and, and climate change. Um, what will be left after this current extinction event and what does that say for the future of the planet? Like what is, what is the future um, after this extinction event, during this extinction event? How qu quickly can evolution respond? Can we avoid a mass extinction now that we know about it? Um, these are all important questions that I want us to consider as we as we think about abrupt climate change and sort of the most visceral response um, or, or reaction to it, which is the sixth extinction, the, the loss of the global ecosystem, the loss of a, of a great number of species um, on the planet. And before we meet again, um, I would love if you could listen to this uh, first link here, which is a podcast on um, a human caused mass extinction on North America about 15, 10 to 15,000 years ago, um, when most uh, large animals on North America suddenly went extinct. Saber-toothed tiger, American mastodon, large, these large uh, megafauna, as we call them, 
Um, and so I'd love for you to listen to this, and then I want to talk about it. Parallels to now, differences between now, um, etc. So this is not classified as necessarily its own extinction event, but could be part of this sixth mass extinction or perhaps preceded it. Um, and, and, and I'll reference this um, slide when we do have that discussion in the Zoom. So I will post that link um, to the Discord channel as well so that you have access to that and can listen to that podcast it's about 20 minutes long or so. So that is the end of this lecture. Um, I hope you have lots of questions, took lots of notes, and we'll have a, a, a great conversation about this um, when we meet.